Welcome to Ask AI, the podcast that brings you insightful interviews and news from the world of Canadian artificial intelligence. This episode is sponsored by Microsoft Canada. Microsoft is committed to building trusted and responsible AI systems. To learn more, go to microsoft.com slash AI and check out their free AI business school to start building intelligence into your solutions today. We're also sponsored by Cinchi, the global leader in data fabric technology. Visit Cinchi.com to learn how to eliminate integration and turbocharge your AI transformation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next episode of the Ask AI podcast. My name is Jackson Kahn, and today I'll be your host. Very excited. Over the last few weeks, we've seen a number of advances in the Canadian AI ecosystem. As always, we're really open to your comments and questions at podcast at askei.org. And we're, we're also focused on releasing a number of new items in the future. You can look forward to our AI News Bulletin, a new website. There's a, there's a lot coming, and, and we're really excited to be sharing that with you. Today, I'm excited to be joined by another luminary in our space. His name is Stéphane Letourneau, and he is the executive Vice President of the Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithms, which very popularly in our country is known as Mila. He brings to Mila his experience of close to 20 years in university and industry relations. He has deep expertise in the management of scientific research and research institutions, with a special emphasis on all kinds of transactions involving science. And in the previous century, Stefan was a partner at Vasky and Martineau, a leading business law and litigation firm, where he practiced litigation in intellectual property and commercial matters. Stefan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. And so, you know, I was just wondering if you wanted to at least start off and, and, and share a bit more about us and, and your professional background and, and also what led you to working at Mila. Yeah. So as you mentioned, I'm an IP lawyer turned technology transfer professional turned manager of research institutes. And I ended up, <laughs> I ended up at l'Université de Montréal heading their uh, sponsored research office in 2016 when the first huge grant, the Canada first uh, grant to put up the structure called IVADO was granted to l'Université de Montréal. And in the path of that, Yosha Benjo was drawing his first, had his, on his drawing board, his first draft of what could be Mila as a autonomous self-standing research institute. And so the VP research asked me to help her with that. And it was a, such a huge undertaking that I had to uh, quit my job as head of the research office and became involved in that in a special advisory role with Hurt and Yoshua. And so we set up the structure, had it going. And when Valérie Pisano, the CEO, was uh, hired by the selection committee, she offered me a job and I couldn't resist it and I left the uh, university. So that's that's what led me to Mila. That's fantastic. It's definitely very cool for me as someone younger in this space to hear a bit more about some of the transitions that you made and, and across different sectors and, and how you connected. And, and I suppose I'm wondering, you know, in, in addition to sort of some of your academic and in your career accomplishments, I was wondering more about what in particular about AI and artificial intelligence captivated you professionally? So science is my deep passion. I, I'm, I'm kind of a failed uh, researcher. I thought in my young age, I would become a scientist, but I left uh, medical school to go to law. I quit medical school, or pre-med, in fact, to go to law and, and law was like a detour to me. And I was so happy to get back into the scientific sector. AI, who is not captivated by AI, right? And the really thrilling experience is all about the fact that we can boast, Canada can boast to be among the very best in the world. So that's just a, a prime thing you want to contribute to. Oh, it's amazing. And it's, I mean, particularly, it's been incredible to see, you know, how quickly things have advanced in the Canadian context and, and how many of our organizations have been really recognized worldwide for their success. If I'm right in saying as well, I think we also have some of the strongest government support, it appears, like for this sector. I know that, you know, the government even more recently has announced super clusters, uh, which are investing more heavily in artificial intelligence. Just interested as well, like maybe compared to when, when you initially got into the space, have you seen a change in that over time, maybe in, in terms of government support of basic research and, and, and really the investment in this space? Well, the, the one thing that made the space happen, I think, it's a combination of factor, but in 2017, there was a deliberate decision by the government to not spray and pray, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of a financial approach, they concentrated their investments in two, three AI Institute under the umbrella of one program. And I think that made a huge difference. That's, that's the federal government. 
And the provincial government followed suit and invested in Quebec, at least very substantially in a a strategy for the development of AI in Quebec. And so there was an alignment of uh, both level of government, of business and of academia to, to make this possible. But this should be mentioned that all of this was made possible by the fact that Canada had a very wise approach to funding fundamental breakthrough and risky research. For example, CIFAR had been funding the work of Yosho Benjo at l'Université de Montréal for 15, 20 years. And the Canada First program that I mentioned earlier that gave that huge grant that allowed the launch of IVADO, the other, our sister organization in many ways, was also key to this uh, happening in Canada. And I, and I believe that, you know, that's probably led to the formation of, of many of these centers of excellence and, and research and learning perhaps including Mila. Uh, and I'm wondering if you might be able to break down more about the Institute's mandates, some of its primary goals, how it's organized. That would be great to learn more about. Yeah, so Mila is a bit of a strange uh, organization. It's, it's kind of unique, but to sum it down to three parts, it's really one, like a turbo on an academic research engine. It's granting academic researchers more space, more technological infrastructure, more agile uh, management to reach out to industry. And then secondly, it's a hub. We have 100,000 square feet in the Mile X neighborhood in Montreal where industry and academia meet. And so we actually have living labs with industry tenants. And thirdly, Mila is a participant in all sorts of efforts to build a, a responsible AI approach. I've always had trouble comparing it to another organization because it's unique. And it's also unique in the fact that it brings together two major Montreal universities at equal footing, McGill and Université de Montréal. They are our primary affiliated institutions. And this is unseen. And in fact, when they suggested that at the outset, I said that that can't be done. And so that's a bit of the mandate and goals. It's organized in terms of locations. Well, as I said, we're in Montreal, based in the Milex neighborhood, which actually became like the AI inner city in Montreal because other companies very quickly followed suit and established uh, labs in the neighborhood, if not in the same building complex. In terms of teams, we now have a headcount of about 700 people in the organization. And most of that is academics. So the teams are researchers and non-researchers, right? And, and the researchers side breaks down into academics and that's the prof and their students. We're close to a 60 head count in terms of prof, half of those being core regular members of Mila, meaning they have an office at Mila, their students have automatically get granted a desk at Mila, et cetera. But in total, that crowd of students and academics make up like 650 people. And then we have the staff, and among the staff, we have two teams of researchers, one who's charged with doing applied AI work with industry to engage with industry for more industrial-driven projects, and the other we call the Innovation Development and Technology Team, and they're tasked with uh, research to evolve the technology, the infrastructure, the computing power technology that the other researchers used. And we have a staff count of about probably over 50. Wow. I mean, that, that's quite an expansive operation. I actually personally didn't know that it was so large. That's, that's so exciting. And you mentioned a couple of times, in particular, you know, Joshua Bengio, but Mila really has some global AI rock stars right. in its leadership team. How important do you think it is in particular that you have these big players and, and how does that help maybe uplift the AI sector in general to have these types of luminaries? Yeah. So I think the general public cannot understand the extent to which Joshua Benjo is a is a world famous <laughs> researcher in this field. I mean, companies, foreign companies come and visit us and sign partnerships and have selfies, you know, CEOs of companies have selfies taken with Yoshra. He's just he's just of this, you know, standard of a rock star. He was the holder and the visionary and the guy who had the plan to just create Mila. So it would not have happened without him. But that being said, He's now surrounded by stars in their fields. And just to name a few, Joel Pinot at McGill, Doina Prickup at McGill, Aaron Corville at l'Université de Montréal, Simon Lacoste-Julien at l'Université de Montréal, and others. I mean, as I said, we now have a count of about 30 or a little bit less than 30 core researchers. It's crucial. So the challenge now is we have to build the capacity and the notoriety of 
of all the team and of Mila itself. So that notoriety is pretty good in terms of the foreign governments and foreign organization. In the academic field, Mila is still a little bit seen as Joshua Benjo's Institute, but this will change. Well, there it is, folks. There's a number of uh, new names to, to keep in mind. Yes. I do hope as well that some of the general public starts to know some of these AI uh, researchers and rock stars as well as they know uh, the names of the hockey players on their favorite team. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the things I wanted to ask about as well is both some of the startups that are part of your ecosystem as well as some of the partners. And yeah, I just wondered, I mean, I know there's the recent announcement from Google mm -hmm. uh, about a $4 million investment they made and, and was also just wondering, you know, how, how do big tech companies like Google as well as startups fit into your ecosystem? Well, yeah, so the, the Google investment made the press and our relationship with large tech giants is an important topic. And we seek to balance the advantage and inconvenient of, of inconvenience is a strong word, but of the perceived overarching weight that they have. But the key points in the, in the balance that we see is that everything we do with the tech giants is open science. So it's the technology after the work, the technology is there for all to benefit from. And the big brands of those companies do help attract talent to our ecosystem in Canada. It does help to attract students, to attract other companies, and to attract generally media attention and public attention and, and decision maker attention. So it's really a plus in, in the ecosystem. And they bring a, a capacity of investment that is unparalleled, of course. Startups fit in the vision because in fact, Joshua often mentions that his hidden agenda was really to make it possible for the next Google to emerge from Mila's rank. We don't know if that will happen, but we do have space for startups reserved uh, and, and we handle that space in a collaboration with La Caisse de Dépôt et Placement du Québec. And we have programs set up for startups that emerge from our ranks, for startups in our space and for other startups. And we see our work with startups also very importantly connected to what the other players in the ecosystem already do. There's a very rich environment in terms of incubators, accelerator programs, for instance, CDL, NextAI, et cetera. So the Montreal ecosystem is pretty rich and we try not to replicate what others are doing, but they're an important part of our ecosystem. Incredible. And, and I guess I'm wondering as well, some of the government relationships you have, whether that's federal agencies like the NRC. Um, we actually just recently interviewed Dr. Carolyn Waters. We've also interviewed Dr. Alyssa Strom, mm -hmm. working with CIFAR. And yeah, I'm just wondering how you work with them and, and other organizations as well. Well, yes, yeah, CIFAR, for instance, and Elisa, I mean, I talk to her every two weeks. CIFAR is okay. the <laughs> agency. Yeah. yeah, CIFAR is the agency that, or the institute that is tasked by the federal government with managing the uh, program that is called the Pan-Canadian AI Strategy. And so they were holding the envelope, the, the funding, the funds of that envelope that was uh, distributed among others, uh, among the three AI institutes in Canada. So we report back to them, in fact, and we are in mm -hmm. very close relationship with them and the two other AI institutes in Canada every, every I mean, in the course of our day-to-day -day business. And I mean, it's going great. And it's really creating a, a, communi a Canadian community beyond what is being done in Montreal. And it feels great. And it's always been a very positive relationship, sharing best practices, sharing initiatives, et cetera. Canada's supercluster is a bit of a neighbor physically and conceptually. For instance, the one supercluster that was awarded in Quebec is, is the uh, Scale AI supercluster about supply chain. And so the supercluster technically is a more applied effort. It's really a consortium of industry that uh, funds a industrial development program. For instance, we, we are funded by uh, the Scale AI supercluster to do work in the um, drug discovery space. And that was a special program that they managed for the federal government in the COVID-19 uh, hurry of efforts to try and advance science. And so we're also very close with them, working closely with them. And then finally, NRC, we've had conversations, we know who they are, they know who we are, but one point, one bridge between our two organizations is one of their programs called IRAP. And we use that program to fund uh, very small Canadian enterprise SMEs in Canada who want to have access to our team of staff scientists for a what is really a consulting relationship. 
So really, these three is an example. These three organizations are an example of uh, beneficial mutual relationships. Are there any particular international organizations outside of Canada that would, would fall into that uh, partnership realm as well? Yeah. For instance, we work with the um, Global Partnership on AI. Mm -hmm. The Global Partnership on AI is, uh, has a strong footing in the OECD. Joshua, Benjo, Catherine Regis are uh, respected uh, researchers at Mila, are respectively a co-president and member of the steering committee of their working group. Because that global partnership, it's really an organization bringing states together. But they've set up working groups in two countries, France and Canada. And in Montreal, the working group on responsible AI is led by Yoshua. So that's one example. We do quite a bit of work with UNESCO. So for instance, Mila and uh, Algora Lab. So this is a, a lab of l'Université de Montréal where the head researcher is a member of Mila. I've had work tasked by UNESCO to put in place a very wide deliberative process with civil society to debate on a um, proposed normative instrument, a worldwide normative instrument on the ethics of AI. So it was a huge undertaking, 54 countries, 611 participants. And the report by Mila and Algoralab was apparently submitted in August. And then UNESCO and Mila also have a joint project. Uh, it's about a publication on the most pressing issues for the future of AI. I could also mention that Yosho was the keynote speaker at the recent uh, event of uh, UNESCO called Ethics of Artificial Intelligence in November. Oh, wow. I'll have to look out for that. That's really yeah. exciting. And then he's going to pronounce the opening statement for at the event called AI for the Planet on February 16th, which is a joint initiative of uh, the UN Environment Program, UNESCO, Microsoft, and Startup Inside. That's quite a roster. <laughs> There's so much going on. That's so exciting. Yeah. I know, we're, I know we're just coming up a little bit on time. I just want to ask you maybe a couple last questions. So one was... You know, in, in general, there, there's a huge regulatory debate going on in, in regards to privacy, particularly in Canada. I know, you know, there, there's some potential changes that could be made. Just wondering for a quick maybe snapshot from your perspective, I know you have a strong background in the legal space, a very, very good reputation there. And, and in the context of now your work with Mila and in the AI space, do you have any maybe top level insights on maybe how we should be thinking about privacy or maybe mm. anything you expect out of this conversation that's happening now at the, at the federal level? Well, that's a huge debate. I think one key factor in that debate is public opinion. It's not necessarily... So the legal system is doing is making progress. As perhaps you know, I mean, both the federal and the provincial legislation are under review, actually, currently. But the real stumbling block might be public opinion. And there's something paradoxical in there because members of the public are... And I'm the first one guilty. I, I mean, I won't consider, you know, for... 15 seconds, the conditions of, under which I give my personal information out to companies like uh, Facebook and, and Google and others. Mm -hmm. But public opinion is really difficult to tackle when health information is concerned. And we've had a very reality check, a bit harsh on that topic, when Mila undertook the effort to build a, an app, not a contact tracing app, but a COVID-related recommendation app that people could have used on their telephone. As, as you may know, that was uh, sidetracked and, and put on the shelf because mostly I think the governments felt that it wouldn't work with public opinion. Our app required data and would require people to feed the app with some health data. And, and so that just didn't fly. And you have to wonder whether, you know, a full reason public debate would not have come to another determination, but time was pressing and, and I certainly understand the government decision. I'm just invoking this as an example of, there's a lot of discussion to be had and of teaching efforts and, and on all parts, on all parties, civil society, scientists, governments. I think we, we need to be made wiser about that. And there are several uh, initiatives that I hope will uh, will undertake to do that. Well, I, I'm fascinated by all angles of this conversation. I think you brought up some really great insights, really great points, some potential questions for further analysis. I know we're just running out of time. Stefan, I wanted to thank you so much for joining us very briefly today and sharing some of your insights, telling us way more about Mila. I'm really excited to continue learning more and potentially attend and watch some of the upcoming talks. Any last things you wanted to mention? Just that uh, I'm really betting on the health sector to 
make a, a demonstration for the greater public that the AI applications can and will provide value for uh, the investment that the governments are considering in that field. I mean, I think we should, you know, keep an eye on the on health technologies. And in Montreal, I know that we're betting on that. And we're working very hard to make things happen. So that's that would be my wish that this would materialize in the, let's say, three to five years. I certainly hope for this as well, for all of our sakes, and, and that perhaps that, that innovation is, is very much made in Canada uh, and that great institutions like Mila are, are at the center of it and, and bring together different sectors and, and great people to work on it. So I know as a Canadian, I'm very grateful for your work uh, and the work of everyone that, that you're working with there at Mila. So thank you so much for joining us and profiling some of that work today, Stefan. Thank you, Jackson. And thank you, as always, to our sponsors again, Microsoft Canada and to Cinchi, uh, who make this possible. Please remember to send us your questions, feedback, and community news to info at askai.org. Again, I'm your host, Jackson Kahn. Thank you again so much to all of our listeners for joining us today. Thanks for listening to the Ask AI podcast. The executive producer was Chris McLellan. Additional production support was provided by Olina Mack and Kristen Riddell. To learn more about our webinar and chatbot projects and get information about sponsorships and volunteering, please visit our website at askai.org or email info at askai.org. Listeners can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Just search Ask AI.